Yes, we should not conclude, especially science should never conclude, what we do not know cannot exist. That'll not be a good thing to do. Yes, but… but nor should we make up stuff for which we have no reason to believe it exists. If we conclude that there is nothing more fundamental apart… apart from electricity, well, then a light bulb lights up, that's enlightenment. We should not look at it that way. It's all brain activity, but brain activity can be really, really complex and there's an awful lot we don't understand, including the effects of meditation. Now, what I am very skeptical of is that any state of meditation, for example, can result in clairvoyance or telekinesis or telepathy or precognition. And we are not talking about clairvoyance, we are not talking about telepathy, please use the telephone. Don't compete with the telephone company, all right? <laughs> Uh, we do have our five senses, each one of which relies on a uh, ingenious little bit of tissue that converts physical energy into neural impulses. I mean, and we might have more than five senses, depending on how you count. Um, but what we don't have, and this is also relevant to whether consciousness is a miracle, is extrasensory perception, ESP, that is access to states of the world not mediated through some physical transmission of, uh, of signals. Uh, ESP often uh, held to comprise <clears throat> telekinesis, the ability to uh, move objects or cause physical changes through brain power. Clairvoyance, the uh, ability to sense the state of the world without any uh, causal chain of transmission of information. Precognition, the ability to foresee the future, uh, and um, uh, telepathy, the ability to sense other people's thoughts. And there is a lively tradition going back millennia of believing that uh, ESP exists, and uh, we know it doesn't exist. I mean, if we know anything, for it, that, that uh, every attempt to demonstrate one of the varieties of extrasensory perception has shown, been shown to be over-interpretation of coincidences interpreted post hoc. You remember the uh, hits, you, you uh, bury all of the, the, the misses and false alarms. Um, sometimes actual fraud and flim-flam, as in the self-designated uh, uh, clair clairvoyants who turn out just to use cheap stage magic. They often fool the physicists because physicists are as foolable by stage magic as anyone else. The ones they don't fool are fellow magicians who can easily expose uh, the tricks. Uh, <clears throat> the fact that there is no ESP, one more bit of evidence is we have never, all it would take is a tiny bit of uh, statistical precognition. You don't even need to foresee events exactly, but just uh, beyond the base rate probabilities, and you could get arbitrarily rich by in the futures market. You could short or, or, uh, or, or long you know, Bitcoin or Tesla stocks, and if you could really see into the, if someone somewhere out there could really see the future, they'd be the richest person uh, on earth, because it would not take very much predictive power uh, 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 to uh, outsmart the rest, of the, the, the rest of the market. No such person exists. More evidence that consciousness is not a miracle, that the senses really are the only way in which we can derive information about em empirical uh, reality. Uh, if someone were to show that ESP existed, I would have to revise a lot of my beliefs about the, the nature of consciousness and mental activity. Uh, we are in no way referring to such things like ESP or magical ways of knowing things, no. I'm talking about the fundamental existence of who we are. Do we exist? I think in most human beings' experience, unless they're lost in their logic, if you simply sit here, you know you exist. So, this knowing that I exist is not a derivative of neuro neuronal and electrical activity in the brain alone. Even beyond that we exist because there are states where all this can come down to almost nothing and still you exist, actually you exist much more.
I am hearing a lot of uh, experiments going on with uh, hallucinogenics and mushrooms and stuff uh, in the universities, not by the students, by the professors <laughs> So, uh, they are saying that uh, when they have these spectacular experiences, the brain activity has actually come down, not gone up as everybody would have believed. So, there are states. See, one important thing is we should not conclude, especially science should never conclude what we do not know cannot exist. That will not be a good thing to do. Yes, but… but nor should we make up stuff for which we have no reason to believe it exists. Thank you. That was great uh, conversation, but um, I think there are millions of people ac around the world, you know, even who have experienced the states of… Uh, the deeper states of meditation. It's not just one or two. From different schools they've experienced, which are not explainable by current ways of examining uh, them because we don't have the tools for it. So we're not able to explain the deeper states of meditation in the states they live in. So that is not made up, right? So how do we experience? That is an unknown thing. So we have… that's all you're saying, just be open and examine that in a way that can we understand that or not? Well, we, we may not understand it in the sense that it involves such um, unfathomably intricate patterns of brain activity leading one brain pattern leading to another brain pattern uh, in ways that we may not understand. I, I don't know if we don't understand it in the sense that it must involve some new form of energy or some kind of uh, contradiction of the idea that it's all brain activity. But brain activity can be really, really complex and there's an awful lot we don't understand, including the effects of meditation. Now what I am very skeptical of is that any state of meditation, for example, can result in clairvoyance or telekinesis or telepathy or precognition. I'm, I'm, and I assume you're not, I'm sure you're not, I assume you're not stating that meditation can accomplish that. No, not at yeah. all. So, yeah. for example, Matthew Ricard's brain, I think Stephen Lawrence is here, he examined his brain and uh, they have looked at their um, brain activity, functional MRI, etc., and they showed a relaxed alert state where everything is fired up and this man is, this is like a trait for him, it's not like a state examination and they could see that that relaxed alertness leads to fired up brain completely but still relaxed. So that is not the usual pattern that happens in normal person who is not meditating, right? So for example. Yes. So we, I'm not proposing that they're clairvoyant, that is very different. I'm just saying that these are rare and uh, these kind of brains, it seems like they're just completely fired up but still very, very relaxed. So that is, a, I think that's a great state to be in. No, that's interesting. I, 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 uh, I admire my chef I had an event with him in Paris in which we talked about yep. the uh, historical uh, processes that, that lead to uh, peace. And it, indeed, there may be aspects of brain function that we don't understand that could be illuminated by meditation, understood as one complex pattern of brain activity leading to another complex pattern of brain activity, all within the realm of the natural. See, uh, the things that we're talking about, clairvoyance, telepathy, these are childish tricks. That's not what we're referring to. The English word meditation doesn't define anything, this is a problem. Because when it comes to subjectivity, English language is very poor. When it comes to objective world, English language is phenomenally effective. Having said that, if someone closes their eyes and sits, generally people say, oh, he or she is meditating. You can close your eyes and do japa, tapa, dharana, dhyana, samadhi, shunya, samyama. Well, these are all distinct states which are thought and transmitted in a systematic way, not just some, uh, you know, some uh, mumbo-jumbo way that uh, I, I try to redefine the word miracle, but you're sticking to the religious form of miracle. I'm not going there. Let's leave that word. Let's say magical experiences, because magic can still be explained, but it's still magical in our experience, leaving that aside. We can clearly transmit this 
aspects distinctly from one to the other. If they come to a dharana uh, initiation, we will do only dharana. If they come to dhyana, we will do only dhyana. If they come to samyama, we do only samyama. Distinctly different states that one, a human being can experience. Is all this about electrical activity? Someday I think, uh, you know, the scientists must invest enough time to study these things, not with the attitude of proving or disproving it, but just by looking at it. Just simply looking at it without making conclusions, because conclusions are coming from what present things that we know, what data that we have. The very… the very fundamental of science is that whatever we know right now is not everything. That is the fundamental of science we are seeking. Because seeking comes from the most fundamental realiz realization that we do not know, that's why we are seeking. Seeking is genuine only if we see, I do not know. If I am seeking this or that, I already know it is there, I am looking for confirmation, that's not seeking, we're just making it up. So, essentially, it is very important if these two disciplines have to meet. It's because these two disciplines meeting is very important for human well-being. Just we thinking that improving the economies of the world which is wonderful, changing the social structures of the world which is fantastic, providing medical care, this, that, everything is fantastic but still, human beings will still not attain to any sense of fulfillment or fullness of experience of life unless they turn inward. This turning inward is not about watching the electrical processes in my brain, it is about looking at something far more fundamental within myself. If… if we conclude that there is nothing more fundamental apart… apart from electricity, well, then a light bulb lights up, that's enlightenment. <laughs> we should not look at it that way. <laughs> now, uh, because we must understand this whole thing is coming from uh, I'm so sorry if I'm making some generalization, it is a generalization, but I'm saying this contextually. See this whole… Uh, the European thing about enlightenment or a period of enlightenment has come because they were under the tyranny of dogmatic belief systems. When they broke away, they felt liberated. But such a thing never existed in the East, we never faced such things. There was no anything dogmatic ruling us, Thinking and, you know, thinking to whatever extent we can was always free for us. So we never thought thinking free is enlightenment. For us, enlightenment is a much more profound process. So breaking away from dogma and thinking freely, it's a basic human right, I don't call that enlightenment. But because of that background, your resistance for the word miracle is essentially coming from the religious, you know, stuff that has happened, people claiming all kinds of uh, miracles happening from here, there, God is talking to me and all this stuff. We are not talking about that, we are not talking about clairvoyance, we are not talking about telepathy, please use the telephone. Don't compete with the telephone company, all right <laughs> So, but is there something more profound to human existence than physiological and psychological drama? In my experience, hundred percent there is. Thank you. So, you've written a lot of books and we wanted to ask additional questions. So, we'll move on from this. So, one of the books that you wrote was Enlightenment Now and that book was, um, Bill Gates called it his book of the century and it's Basically, you make a case for reason, science, humanism, and logic. Progress. Right. And, uh, sorry, and progress. Thank you for correcting me. So, what you have said is over the centuries, people have become better, they live better, their income has gotten better, and they're happier, and all of that. And also, you're saying sometimes blips happen during the lifetime. Like, for my lifetime, if I look at this, over the year, centuries, yes, things have improved, a lot of uh, good things have happened. But still, when I'm living, for me what is real is the current 
um, uncertainty that exists or the wars and etc. that is happening. So just knowing that we have progressed is enough. When there is uncertainty like that, what do we do? Just knowing is that enough for to correct ourselves, course correction? Yes, the, um, so <clears throat> enlightenment now won me a, a lot of unearned friends among uh, Buddhists, but it isn't about that kind of enlightenment. It really is about the uh, ideals that came out of the enlightenment of the 18th century. Um, the, uh, I tried to document that progress was not a matter of optimism, not a matter of seeing the bright side, of seeing the glasses half full, but it was an empirical hypothesis that could be tested. That is, if we agree on what, uh, what is good, and I think most people would agree that it's better to be you know, alive than dead, better to be well-fed than hungry, better to be uh, well than sick, better to be affluent than poor, better to be educated than illiterate and ignorant, better to be happy than uh, unhappy, and so on. All of these things can be measured, and if they've increased over time, uh, that would be progress. And I had 75 graphs, and most of them have increased over time. Now, never in a straight line, never even monotonically, which is to say always increasing and never decreasing, all of them have uh, dips along the way. Now, having been reminded of the fact that progress is a real empirical phenomenon, it's natural to think, and people in the 19th century did think, that there is a force in the universe that somehow lifts us ever upward. Now, this would be uh, a miracle, and as you can probably tell from my remarks so far tonight, I don't believe in miracles. And this progress wasn't a miracle. The reason that there are fewer famines is that people like Sadhguru advocated conserving soil. And, uh, vigorous hybrids and synthetic fertilizer and crop rotation. The reason that lifespans expand, uh, uh, more than doubled is because of sanitation and antibiotics and blood transfusion. And, and uh, for every one of the dimensions of progress, there was a cause. If we understand those causes uh, correctly, and it's not easy to do it because lots of things happen at once, so it's not so easy to disentangle them and figure out what the, the uh, primary cause was. But the, uh, the, the benefit of understanding progress is that we can uh, have more of it. That is, not by relying on any miracle, but by doing the things that worked in the past and that are likely to work in the future. Conversely, it means that if those causes of progress are neutralized, we could get stasis or regression. And indeed, there are periods in which various um, uh, events happen that are regressions, not progress. The, the war in Ukraine is a prime example. And I would say that that is uh, exactly what, you <clears throat> what would happen if one of the causes of the increase in peace over the last 75 years, namely the replacement of a valorization of national glory and greatness by the well-being of men, women, and children. Uh, it is that change in ideas that helps drive uh, the rate of war down. But if you have a leader that is drunk with the opposite ideology, who believes that national glory, spheres of influence, um, national greatness, civilizational grandeur, is the ultimate value, and uh, if people die, then so much the worse, then you, you won't have increased progress toward peace. You might have backtracking toward war, and that's, that's what we are seeing uh, in Ukraine, for example. Likewise, in the um, extension of the human lifespan, again, not a miracle. It happens because we had uh, vaccines and, and antibiotics and sanitation. If the germs evolve faster than we can develop um, vaccines and, and, and antivirals and antibiotics, then lifespan can go down, as it did during the uh, pandemic. Fortunately, reason and science, together with humanism, I argue, are the three drivers of the progress we've, we've observed, um, push back, and the pandemic is now um, under greater control, and the increase in longevity appears to have resumed. There's also a comment that mental health pandemic is on the rise. The, the, me, the mental health pandemic is on the rise right now. So 
the, what is the, the mental health. Oh, mental health. Yeah. Well, in some countries, in some demographics, yes. So in uh, Amer sorry, American um, uh, teenagers and, and young adults, um, there has been a, an increase in uh, anxiety and depression. This uh, more so for uh, young women than young men, more so for left-wing young women than right-wing young women. Um, so this is a, uh, a phenomenon that is, uh, occurs with some sectors, and more so in the United States than in other countries. Now this is, we don't understand why, but uh, again, because the progress that we have seen, including increase in happiness and a decrease in suicide worldwide, but it doesn't happen everywhere all the time, um, that would be a miracle, and it's not a miracle. And if there are causes of unhappiness, an anxiety, that are more concentrated in some countries, some demographics, some ages, some periods, we should work very hard to find out what they are so that we could uh, undo them. Well, there's no question uh, the kind of progress we have made in the last hundred years in terms of comforts, conveniences that we have achieved through progress of science and technology. We are the most comfortable generation ever in the history of humanity. Nobody had it this good, especially for women and children. It's never been this good ever in the history of humanity. There's simply no question about that. <coughs> but one important thing that's happened is in previous generations, basic survival was such a challenge. Because basic survival was such a challenge, it kept everybody focused, there was not much struggle in the mind because daily getting my bread, when it's a struggle, you don't have much to drive yourself nuts, all right? <laughs> you don't have enough time <laughs> to drive yourself crazy. But as the survival issue is settled in the human being, you will see more and more struggles on the psychological level because the physical struggles are gone, now the struggle moves into the software department from hardware. So this struggle we may see as mental illnesses and so many kinds of sufferings that people are going through, which unfortunately leads to a very high rate of suicide today in the world, almost in many countries, but unfortunately in most affluent countries it is, it is at the highest. So our economic development and social liberties, everything is fine. But still if we don't address how a human being experiences oneself, how to manage human experience, we are engineering the whole world the way we want it. Fantastic, no question. What is one person's miracle is another man's engineering. I'm fundamentally from the engineering background. So, what is an airplane is a miracle for one person, is a engineering for another person. So, the whole thing goes the same way with us also because this is the most sophisticated machine on the planet. Have we engineered it well? Have we made it the way we want it? Because a well-engineered something means when we say this building is well engineered, we are saying it works well for the purpose for which we are here. When we say my car is well engineered, we are saying it works the way I want. But is your mind, is your body working the way you want? If it did, would you have any suffering? Would you have any, uh, you know, uh, struggles within you? Obviously it's not working the way you want. Your own intelligence is turning against you and torturing individual people. Uh, people don't need any help from outside. Normally, you know, people come to me, uh, Sadhguru, my mother-in-law, I can't take it anymore, my husband is like this, my wife is like that, my boss is like this. I say, you do one thing, you come here. No mother-in-law, no husband, no wife, no boss, just you. You come. I will give you a nice place to stay and good food to eat. You don't have to do anything, just… just stay in the room, just be joyful, that's all. I just make some random checks on you. If you're miserable, we'll stop feeding you because I don't believe in feeding misery <laughs> So, 
So, you leave them in one place for twenty-four hours, they will be twisting themselves in so many ways. So you don't need any outside help. When there is outside help, you think it's because of this person I'm miserable, it's because that person I'm miserable. No, the problem is you do not know how to handle your own faculties, your own memory, your own imagination. What is it that people are suffering? What happened ten years ago, they're still suffering. What may happen day after tomorrow, they're already suffering. Essentially, you're not suffering life. You are suffering two most important faculties which are distinct and a great privilege for the human being which no other creature has, a very vivid sense of memory and a fantastic sense of imagination. These are the two things we are suffering. Without this, we wouldn't even be human, we would be like any other creature. So, when you find your own mind troubles you and makes you suffer, you can call it anger, you can call it stress, you can call it anxiety or more serious ones. Essentially, it is your intelligence turning against you. This means you do not know how to hold it, you do not know how to hold yourself. This great privilege of being human, when I say the great privilege, at least according to evolutionary sciences, you are supposed to be the peak of evolution. That means you're on top of the world. But are you feeling like you're top of the world? <laughs> Most people are not, they're dragging their feet and going around with great suffering within themselves. This suffering is not because of life around you. This suffering is your inability to handle yourself. So one important aspect of our education process should be, we are always thinking about how to conquer everything around us. It's important we also bring this into our life, our society, that how to manage this in such a way that it never turns against me. This is very important. If we don't learn this, if we do not pay attention to this, how not to turn my own memory, my own imagination, my own intelligence against myself, if this awareness does not arise within us, then we may have everything and we will suffer. People can live in a palace and they are living miserably. This is happening all over the place. So, in previous generations, a lot of people like to see in previous generations, people who are very peaceful, very happy, it's not true, believe me. Uh, it, it's not true, it is just that past, because of the distance in… in… Uh, in southern Indian languages, there is a saying, a faraway hill looks smooth and wonderful. With past, there is a distance. Because there's a distance, everything about it is wonderful you know? But if it's here, then there is a struggle because you have to tread through the whole thing. This process of suffering our own memory, our own imagination, our own intelligence is essentially because the necessary awareness as to how this function, what can we do about it, is not subjective. Objectively, we may know how it functions, we may be reading it on the MRIs and EEGs and this and that, but Human, individual human beings do not know how it works within me, what can I do about it, how should I hold my intelligence, in what context, so that it always works for me, never against me. Well, a very, <clears throat> very wise and another way of uh, putting the point is to quote Franklin Pierce Adams, the best explanation for the good old days is a bad memory. Now, um, I, I do want to, to uh, though, uh, update one point, is that globally, suicide rates have come down by a lot, by like 40 percent over the last 30 years for the period for which we have data, uh, not in the United States. The United States suicide rates have gone up since their low point in the late 1990s. Again, we don't completely understand why, I, I, I hope we will, but, uh, but it's important to to keep in mind that the United States in many ways has its own national pathologies that are not true of other affluent democracies and not true of, of the world. And in terms of suicide, in most countries, not all rates of suicide have come down by a lot, including uh, India. One of the… I'm going to respond. Uh, about, about the suicide rate, those countries uh, where there was economic distress and people who are taking their lives out because it was simply not able to survive. 
In those countries it's come down, but where there is economic well-being for at least two, three generations, in those countries it's gone up, that's what we have noticed. Well, not all, because I India has gotten far more affluent in the last thirty years and the suicide rate has come down. Um, but the… Um, <laughs> the, for the, the people who… Um, I mean, GDP per capita in India, it's, it's uh, one of the economic success stories of the last uh, 30 years. <clears throat> the, uh, one of the factors that seems to drive the… for people who've looked at what has driven suicide rates downward, one of them is urbanization, that rates in, in many countries are much higher in rural areas, partly because you often get um, women who are in arranged or forced marriages, who are ripped away from their family, their friend, they're living uh, under the control of their <clears throat> mother-in-law in, uh, uh, in a town which they have no social contacts and they will sometimes end their lives. When you have the freedom in a city to uh, develop friends and social contacts, to, be, to, to choose your social circle, that leads to the social connections that make suicide much less likely. Talking about… talking about India, uh, <laughs> see, I'm very closely involved with the Indian society, its economy, how it works. India has made huge progress in the last uh, couple of decades, no question about that. But that progress belongs to a small percentage of people. There are many Indias, you can at least identify five layers of India. So one layer of India is doing phenomenally well, Another layer of India is benefiting from the first layer. Third layer, little bit of trickle down. But down under, where nearly fifty-five percent is in agriculture, there it's bad. So most of the suicides which are happening in India today is unfortunately in the agricultural sector. So we are working on this, there is no immediate solution as such, it's a, not an overnight thing. So there is… Um, it's a great conversation, I think uh, people want to ask questions, but I just wanted to ask you one last thing before I hand it over. Um, let's keep it short. One, you were, you were talking about dirt, right? So um, there's a certain sensitivity to it from the point of view, is it really dirt? Should we call it as dirt that is useless or should we call it as soil that is giving life? Uh, no, I, ca I call it dirt just to emphasize its physicality and indeed the fact that, of course, dirt has a negative connotation. Yes, <clears throat> I like was, miracle. Yes, as opposed to soil. Uh, I was using it deliberately and ironically to not to denigrate soil. I think soil deserves our utmost admiration. It's, it's the basis of life. But rather to remind people that it is physical stuff that we depend on and by choosing the word that reminds, that doesn't have that noble halo, uh, it is a way, it was a way of emphasizing my point that physical stuff matters. Uh, we tend to denigrate it, we shouldn't. Soil is important, uh, maybe we shouldn't call it dirt, but calling it dirt reminds us… You're a linguist, so that's why I wanted to ask Yes, well, re calling it dirt is just a reminder that we should think twice about some of the things we take for granted. Uh, and indeed, choosing a, <clears throat> uh, a, a synonym with a better connotation may be a way of changing those attitudes, but in an argument like the one that I'm making, it was a reminder that uh, we shouldn't treat physical stuff as um, tawdry, um, uh, as, as beneath our uh, dignity to discuss and to take seriously. Uh, very much so, I'm, uh, I knew when you uttered the word dirt, you were speaking in that context, but uh, uh, in the Eastern cultures, in most Eastern Asian cultures, particularly in India, we always refer to soil as mother soil. When we will never say simply soil, we'll say thaimannu. That means it's mother soil. Because the word mother does not mean our biological mother. That which is the source of who we are is mother. Well, in your computer there's a motherboard. 
that doesn't mean it delivered the computer, it is just that it is the source of everything that's happening there. So in that sense, soil is the largest living system, not just on this planet, but in the known universe, it is the largest living system. A handful of soil has eight to ten billion organisms. It's a massive living system. In many ways, it is the foundational life for who we are. It is just that our attitude towards soil has become like this, that uh, we built, let's say we built one house for our, ourselves, one floor and then our family expand, expanded, so we want to build the next floor. So we decided, why do all this? Just take the foundation stones and build the first floor. Well, this is going to be a disaster, that's the approach that we have right now, because nearly eighty-five percent of the nations on the planet still treat soil as a resource, not as a source of life not as a living system, just as a resource that we can use whichever way we want. Fifty percent of United States soil has disappeared in the last seventy years and uh, twenty-seven thousand species of organisms are disappearing every year. This is the amount of extinction that's happening. In another twenty-five to forty years' time, every UN agency is warning that there will be no agriculture because once the organism uh, qu uh, quantity goes down in the soil, it becomes like sand. Desertification is one of the main issues. There's a whole agency for combating desertification called UNCCD, who are partners with us in making this happen. Having said that, there is a… it's okay to tell a joke, right? <laughs> uh, this happened in 2016. In 2060, a few scientists sought an appointment with God. Don't… don't go by this, I am not a… that kind of a believer, but I'm just telling you a joke <laughs> They sought an appointment with God and they got the appointment, they went there and they told him, Hey old man, you've done great with creation, but everything that you… you can do, now we can also do, so it's time you retire. So God said, Oh, is that so? What is it that you can do? Give me a demo. They said, look at this, and they took some soil, made a vague image of a human infant, they did this, that and that, and the child cried, alive. God said, that's very impressive, but first get your own soil. <laughs> we'll go to… Um, I think we have time for maybe one or two questions, so… I think mic runners are there, so they should go. Mic runners didn't come here <laughs> <laughs> Yes. One of the central tenets of the Hindu religion is that uh, something sur survives uh, after death. And you mentioned uh, that uh, consciousness is uh, eliminated at the time of death. And I'd like to sort of cite to you several examples to the contrary. Uh, so I'm standing here today and I have witnessed myself change over decades. I've, I've, I've seen myself go from childhood to where I am today. And, uh, but something within me has stayed the same that has witnessed the change. So that's one argument. The other, as a sleep physician, I can tell you is that when I go to sleep and wake up in the morning, I'm aware if I had great sleep or bad sleep or I was totally unconscious. So again, there was something deeper inside me that sort of witnessed all those stages of sleep. And finally, you know, when I experience life through the different senses and I keep going back, there seems to be something within the rearmost portions of my brain that's witnessing it. I'm witnessing you making your arguments and I'm sensing them, but there is something way behind that has stayed stable. So I think that's the central tenet of our religion, uh, Vedanta it's called, that whatever it is in my consciousness that survives my demise is also the same in you as well. 
and in all of us. And I'm wondering if you have any answer to that. Well, <clears throat> I, I, I was with you until you made the leap to uh, what survives after you die. Because all that, all that other stuff, like the part of you that uh, uh, goes to sleep, uh, goes, uh, passes out of consciousness, comes back into consciousness, I mean, that's still your functioning brain. The part of you that you like to think is continuous from your childhood to your adulthood, again, your brain's been working the whole time. So, yeah, I'm with you for all of that, but that says nothing about what happens when the brain permanently ceases to function. Now, by the way, this is not to say that there aren't uh, puzzles, conceptual mysteries about what philosophers call the problem of personal identity. So, for example, if an 18-year-old uh, commits a crime, should he still be in jail when he's 65? Is it, in a sense, the same person? Is it morally justifiable to make the 65-year-old suffer for what the 18-year-old did? Or is there some sense in which that was kind of not the same person uh, because the brain was different? And there are many other uh, puzzles that philosophers, Derek Parfit probably being the most famous, have explored. None of them, though, I would say, cast doubt on the idea that uh, a functioning brain is absolutely necessary for consciousness and that when the, the, it stops functioning, consciousness ceases. Can I say something about that? Uh, one thing, sir, I would uh, like to correct is, we must understand that uh, you call something a religion only if you're forced to believe something that is not in your experience. So the Vedanta that you refer to and the Hindu culture and traditions that you refer to have no belief systems. It is a land of seeking. You're supposed to seek. This is the reason why in that culture there are no commandments. Nobody can give us commandments. Who can give commandments to Indians? They're full of questions. So, uh, this is a process of seeking. How many ways of seeking? Well, we came up with thousands of ways of seeking, different ways for each individual how to seek. But the fundamental is, the fundamental of seeking as I already said once is, that you have realized that you do not know. That's why you're seeking. Because most human beings do not understand the significance of I do not know. I do not know is the basis of longing to know. And longing to know is the basis of if at all, if you know one day, at least the possibility of knowing opens up only because we realize, I do not know. Having said that, the important thing about what you're saying, this is a university, I don't know if this is a place for going to this aspect because you talked about beyond death what happens and it need not be just an assumption or uh, something that you believe. The fundamental is this, as we sit here, this is my body, that is your body, hundred percent. This is my mind, that's your mind. Here and there we may overlap, but this is my mind, that's your mind. But there is no such thing as my consciousness and your consciousness. There is only one consciousness. You have captured some, I have captured some. We have methods and ways. How? you can capture a larger bubble, so that suddenly everything about you is enhanced. I can show you a hundred and thousands or millions of people who are at one level of living, suddenly they move to another level of experience and living simply because they manage to blow their bubble little bigger. So this bubble, the film of the bubble is essentially information. This information in in the culture that you come from, we call this karma. Karma means as we sit here, our body is doing activity, this is one kind of karma, physical karma. Our mind is doing things, this is mental karma. Our emotions are doing stuff, that is emotional karma. Our energy is doing things, that's emo this energetic karma. Four dimensions of karma are happening to us in wakefulness and sleep, non-stop. Now, how identified you are with those things will create tendencies within you. These tendencies, we very rightly refer to as vasana. Vasana is a perfect word for this because the word vasana means smell or odor. 
So what kind of vasana you have depends on what kind of tendency you develop, what kind of tendency depends on what kind of information that you gathered in so many unconscious ways. So this information determines what kind of a person you are, but what kind of a being you are. When I say what kind of a being, see you are the only life on this planet which is referred to as a being, not because human beings had the dominance over language, no. It is because you are the only one who can determine how to be. All other creatures respond instinctively to whatever their requirements are and whatever the external stimuli is. So, what you are referring to as what is beyond life, what is beyond this body, beyond this psychological drama that we are going through, is just a bubble of information that may travel. But there are ways to... You also know, having... you mentioned Hindu, so that means the objective of that culture is to attain liberation or mukti. What this means is, you deprive yourself or you demolish all this karma or this information that you have gathered or distance yourself in such a way that this bubble doesn't carry on. That's a whole process. Now this is too far-fetched for you because I'm going too rapidly, there are too many loopholes in this, but this can be properly put across and it can be made to be experienced not just talking about it. So I just have a follow-up. Um, your book, Blank Slate, the, it is a very popular book, and you talk about there is no blank slate, people come with certain, you know, you, you also talk about the behavioral genetics portions of it, 40% if I, sorry if I'm wrong with the percentages, you talk about genetic influences is 40% and 10% is environment and there is unknown, there is another 40 to 50% is unknown. Am I saying the right percentage? In the, in the differences among people, yes. 40. So what is that unknown that we have, that 50% is unknown pieces that influences behavior, what do we well, attribute that to? It is, it is unknown, but I can give you the, um, some possibilities. One of them is random events in the development of the brain, in utero or afterwards, that the genes don't have nearly enough information to specify the wiring of the brain down to the last synapse. And there may be some <clears throat> stochastic, that is to say random processes in the growth of neurons and their interconnections, where the genes keep the, uh, the, the brain development in a... Um, band of functioning, but there's a lot of random variation within those boundary conditions. Uh, there may be effects of arbitrary events as you live your life that have um, uh, cascading effects, chaotic effects perhaps, that uh, add up. Just to, by the way, to be concrete to specify what it is we're talking about, Imagine two identical twins, I'm sure many of you, probably all of you know some twins, and I'm not talking about the exotic cases where they're separated at birth, reunited in adulthood, and they have all of these amazing similarities. That is interesting in terms of reminding us of the importance of genes, but now consider the twins, the ordinary twins, like the ones you all know, that maybe some of you are, who, who are brought up together, who have the same brought up in the same neighborhood, same parents, same older sibs, same younger sibs, same number of books in the house, same number of TVs in the house. Are they literally identical? No, they're not identical, and any of you know twins, no, they're not. Now, where do those differences come from? They didn't come from their genes, they, I mean, unless there were new mutations after conception. They didn't come from the environment as we usually think of uh, in the environment. That's the puzzle, and that's what we don't know. Uh, to me, it signifies an enormous and underappreciated uh, uh, effect of random causes, whether they, are, whether they are random causes in brain development, in brain functioning, or in environmental experiences that have larger effects than we appreciate. Uh, it, would, it, it is, I think, one of the great surprises that behavioral genetics has revealed to us. Sadhguru, can we influence these random variations? Uh, it, that, that's what it seems. Now, th that, that's what I would conclude. It is possible that there are subtle aspects of the environment that are very difficult to measure that have uh, uh, predictable non-random effects. That seems uh, kind of unlikely. That seems to be a, a, a kind of prayer. Uh, I, I think it's more likely that there's a, a lot more randomness 
than uh, we intuitively think of. The significance of being a, a human being, not a human creature is just this. All of us definitely come with a certain amount of information from our parentage. We pick up much more through our childhood and maybe adolescence and stuff. But still, will we limit ourselves to the information that's come to us and what we have gathered or will we go beyond that is what human being is about. If we are just a replica of parentage in whatever way, small modifications in this and this, human life has gone waste because this is why you are a human being. That means you can transcend whatever your body speaks, whatever your mind speaks, beyond that you can transcend and make yourself into something well beyond what the information that the body and the mind carries. If you do not exercise this choice, in many ways human possibility has gone waste because we are not exploring the possibility of being a being, we are just trying to be a better creature than others. In competition we may earn better, we may qualify better, we may run better, we may jump better, but this is just being a better creature which all the other creatures are doing. Every other creature is striving to be competitive and being better than another one. So this possibility that you can actually distance yourself from your genetic information, we can show you any number of examples where even the shape of their face will change within a matter of few days. If they go through certain initiation processes, you will see the very shape of their face will change distinctly noticeable for everybody. You can, I can show you pictures, I can show you people who, how they were and how they are today because once the genetic information, there's a distance between you and that, suddenly there are phenomenal changes. And in uh, the culture that you're talking about, there are death rituals. We, we are doing these things to distance ourselves from our parentage because if the influence of parental genetics are too heavy on us, we will not be a fresh life, we will just be a copy. So we want to be a fresh life. So all the time there are many processes, many methods, both when they are living and when they are gone, both ways we have methods with which we distance ourselves from the, our own genetics because without that there is no new life, it's just a repeated life. So. This whole process of doing things with the genetic memory, the energetic memory, the chemical memory in the system, well, Bala is doing research right now on how your chemistry can be changed within four to six weeks of doing a simple twenty-one minute practice is well established, nobody can question that because our idea of truth has to come from lab, this… this idea must go. La truth comes from life. Life and deeper experiences of life. <laughs> Is everybody here experiencing life at the same level of profoundness? Definitely not, isn't it? So can we enhance this? Definitely yes. How many will enhance it? It's a question of willingness. It's a question of how much life you're willing to invest in enhancement of your experience. Most people are interested in enhancement of their social presence, their economic presence and other things. But essentially, all the things that we are doing, see why we want education, why we want wealth, why we want relationships is we believe these things will enhance the experience of life, isn't it? Hello? It may or it may not, that's a different matter. But the hope is that it will enhance. In some ways it will enhance, in some ways it may not help. These things are happening, that's individual. With some people they may make use of their education and wealth in a fantastic way. Whole lot of people make misery out of their money. These are different people. So what we make out of enhancements of social and other structures is different. But enhancement of life, the very life that I am, the very being that I am, enhancing that, there is a way, there is a methodology. Uh, there are cultures who have invested millennia of effort in this direction, which cannot be wiped out and that is the most important thing 
in, right now in the world because science and technology has brought more comfort and convenience that people are ready for, unfortunately. They're not able to enjoy their comfort and convenience. Today the problem is not of hunger, the problem is of overeating, all right? At least a third of the people are suffering from obesity and stuff. So it's important that this time we know how to enhance this life, not enhance just our life situations and our lifestyles. Thank you, Sadhguru. Thank you so much and wonderful and thank you all.